Great Day Nation is the bus stop today for my Hall of Fame brother, Jerome Bettis, who has had an unbelievably rich, interesting uh, life and one of the coolest nicknames in sports, the bus. The bus stops at Great Day Nation right now. And I want to say welcome to my good friend, my Hall of Fame brother, Jerome Bettis. Bus, how are we doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. We've been trying to get this done for a while, and uh, finally, <laughs> uh, finally, we're, we're able to do it. And I'm excited to have you. And, and, I, and I just, you're one of these guys to me, Jerome, that are larger than life. You walk into a room, everybody knows the bus has arrived. And, uh, you know, the, the big smile that you bring, uh, the energy you bring. Were you always like that? You grew up in Detroit, tough times. You and your brothers, you and your siblings, tough, tough times from what I read. Talk to me about Detroit, about your family a little bit and growing up there and uh, just what carried you through that, those early years. Yeah, well, for, for, for me, I had a very, very close-knit family. Uh, I have an older brother, older sister, and the family was was built around love. And it, obviously, it was not a lot of money around, obviously, um, because we, we grew up in the, in the hood uh, in Detroit uh, in a tough environment. But my mom and dad didn't let that deter them from, you know, raising us uh, the right way and, and with... Um, you know, with our moral compass correctly positioned. And, and so they did a lot of things to, to kind of shield us and protect us from certain things, but obviously there were certain things they, they couldn't protect us from. So it was, you know, it was a, it was a tough childhood, but a, but a good one. And I think that's where I have developed the, if you will, the, the life skills that have taken me so far, but also the humility to know where where I've come from, to know the other side of the street, to know uh, what it feels like to not have uh, much money and uh, still be successful in terms of um, you know your life goals and your ambitions. And so, for me, I, I thought you know growing up, may, it made me uh, a tougher person, and ultimately kind of led to the person that I've become because. Uh, it was, you know, tough upbringing, but mom and dad, like I will say, they were in the house, they were there, they were parenting 24-7 because it was uh, a lot of distractions, a lot of things that could have uh, derailed uh, myself or, or, or my uh, siblings, and mm -hmm. they didn't let that happen, so I just think my mom and dad did an incredible job of, uh, of raising all three of us. Sports had, of course, was in the forefront, and was was that a refuge for you? Was that a place where you could go to and say, man, I, I know, and I'm sure your parents probably thought the same way. Hey, as long as, as long as Jerome is doing sports, he's not going to get into any other trouble. So let's yeah. get him involved in sports. Yeah. You know? and, and, and that's exactly what, what my mom thought of, but it wasn't the sport that most people think of. It was bowling. Yeah. Uh, I, grew up, I grew up as a bowler. And so my mom figured that, you know, it'd be great to teach us how to bowl because on the weekends when guys are, you know, with your friends and you don't have much uh, constructive things to do that she could take us out of that environment, put us in the bowling lanes on Saturdays and Sundays, teach us how to bowl. And that would help our overall development. And she was 100% correct because as a kid growing up, I, you know, I wanted to be, you know, in the lane, on the lanes, bowling on the weekends, traveling, going to tournaments. So it, it was, it was very much um, uh, an important part of, of my childhood because it did its intended purpose, kept us off the streets, but also kept us competitive. And so I was very competitive at, at a very young age and, and it uh, turned out to be very, very beneficial. And let's face it, I mean, bowling attire, you know, the unis that you get to wear in a bowling alley, it's just badass. Let's face it. I mean, the shirts, the shoes, you probably had your own ball, right? Yeah. That was so, custom yeah. made. That's and right. Did you have like a little, well, this was before you took the nickname, the bus, right? Uh, right. We had to wait a little bit longer for that one. But did you bowl at 300? I have a 300 game. 
it wasn't when I was young. It was, I was about, I think I was 25 years old at the time. And it was at a um, pro-am, much like a, a charity golf tournament. It yeah, was a, like a charity Wednesday. bowling mm-hmm. event. Uh, but the bowling event was for the um, Brunswick, one of the companies that, that makes a lot of the equipment. Brunswick Lanes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And Brunswick Lanes, they make the bowling balls. And Brunswick is a big name in terms of bowling, all things bowling and they also represent bowlers Mm -hmm. so they had a a pro-am there and they had about 10 professional bowlers there and that's where I bowled the 300 so it was um very it was it was a big big moment because all the pros were watching me throw it as well as the fans as well as the media uh there was cameras it was it was a ton of of um of press so it was a it was a uh, a big moment for me were you more nervous in the tenth frame, knowing that you know where I'm going with this already? Yeah. Were you more nervous throwing that last strike, or when you lined up in Detroit in your hometown at the Super Bowl and running the Rock? What was more scary uh, and daunting for that, you? I, I tell you, the, the 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 bowling moment was probably more scarier because the the football part that's what that's what i you know I, you I was able to do and that's what i did and and yeah. i live for that yeah. and when you get in the game all those moments kind of disappear it you know you, it gets back to the basics right yeah. you don't you don't see the crowd you don't see all that you kind of just zero in well yeah. with bowling it was a little bit different because every time i bowl the pressure adds and adds and adds Mm-hmm. But not only that, the crowd adds. So after every strike, the crowd is bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time I got to the last, my last frame, we had a ton of people around, but then they decided to put a camera <laughs> in the gutter. So oh. there was a camera in their gut, a person with the camera in the gutter as I was bowling. And so it was one of those it was a tough moment, but it was one that football had prepared me for because I was comfortable in that environment with the, with the crowd. I love that. And, and I can just see you there. Certainly not a time to roll a gutter ball at that point. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and football was where you belonged, my brother. You know, that's where you flourished. And uh, you can make an analogy to, to bowling, too, there, because you were, when you ran the rock, you were like a bowling ball and those pins with defenders trying to trying to stop <laughs> uh, the mayhem coming at them, you know? So there is a little bit of uh, a parallel universe there between what you were doing at a young age, I think, and then what you, what you started to do uh, when, the, when it really started to, to matter for you. And, yeah. you know, you went to Notre Dame, you were with the Irish, a hell of a school. Now, I read somewhere that you're still taking classes because you dropped, you know, you didn't drop out. You just left after your junior year. You got drafted. I mean, there were there was some uh, moolah to have. You know, we got to go, <laughs> we got to go make some paper. And I totally get that. But I'm really proud of the fact that you. Uh, can, can you get me up to speed on your studies? And, yeah, and so, do you graduate? Are you graduating soon? So so yeah, I um, I left as a undergrad, and you know, obviously with the NFL, the I left um, as a junior. Mm-hmm. and went to the NFL. And yep. when I was in the NFL, I went back for a semester and took some classes. And then I decided about a year ago that I wanted to look at finishing my degree. Okay. Um, and not just for you know me, but for my family. My mom want, wanted to see me do it, my kids. Um, so it was just one, it was something I thought that you know I wanted to partake in. So we went down the road and, and with uh, COVID, created the opportunity for me to take classes online. So I, I did last semester and now I'm taking two currently now in summer school. And this is the last week, uh, the last weeks of um, the class. So hopefully after the summer school classes are done, then I will have, I believe, four more uh, classes uh, before I complete the degree. So I, I think I'm, I'm pretty close. Uh, the only problem is um, I do have uh, commitments uh, that I've got to be certain places at certain times. So school creates a, a, a big uh, issue for me, but it's one that I'm willing to uh, tackle 
uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So hopefully the degree is um, is somewhere in the near future. I'm, I'm very proud of, of the fact that you've, you know, made that full circle. I think that's really important. And I think it's going to really resonate with you when you stand there, if, if you go through a physical, you know, yeah. uh, commencement service or program. Graduation. Yeah, yeah. graduation and uh, go through that. It's uh, it's one of the coolest things, man, that, that I did, certainly at Michigan State. I was a Spartan, but um, we played you guys, uh, you know, with the Touchdown Jesus. It was a great place, Notre Dame. And uh, <laughs> my niece went to Notre Dame on a, on a track scholarship, too. So uh, got a lot of affinity for, for the Irish there, and it's been great. So let's talk a little bit about your pro career. I mean, much has been said about it. Obviously, you get drafted by the Rams, and, uh, but that's not really where you're going to make your name, although you were balling with the Rams. And you were yeah. an all pro as a rookie. Yeah. So I, I get drafted by the Rams and, you know, obviously being a top 10 pick, um, the teams that, that usually draft in the top 10 are always the teams that, that kind of struggled the year before. So we didn't have a great football team, but um, uh, the head coach, his name was Chuck Knox and he wanted to run the football. And, and yeah. I just kind of fit right into what he was trying to do. And, yeah. And my, my, my rookie year, I had a, you know, really big rookie season was, was I think, 40, 50 yards away from a rushing title and, you know, had had a, a tremendous year. And I'll never forget, I go to the Pro Bowl and I'm a rookie. So I'm at the Pro Bowl and the other two running backs that were on the team with me was Barry Sanders and Emmett Smith. And I'm saying to myself, boy, I'm in pretty good company. These guys are the guys I've been watching on TV uh, for the last couple of years. And, and so here I am right next to them. So it was a humbling moment, but um, mm -hmm. it really kind of told me that I was on the correct path and that I was good enough to, to be in that position that I was in. So that begs the question when you, when you started, first of all, I mean, that had to be eye opening staying there with those two legends, but was there a running back? Was it a Barry Sanders or was it Emmett? Maybe it was Walter Payton. Maybe it was Earl Campbell. Was there a guy you try to emulate, try to look up to somebody you said, man, this guy runs the way I want to run. You know, it's funny because growing up, as I said earlier, I was a bowler, so I didn't watch football. I didn't, I didn't know much about any of those guys. But as I started to play, uh, you know, I started to watch and see, and and I became a fan of of fullbacks. And so it's crazy. I was watching these, you know, these guys in college uh, run the option and stuff like that. I really wasn't so fixed on the NFL because. I'd never really, only time I watched the NFL games were, were on Thanksgiving uh, when we were with the family. So outside of that, I didn't know many of the players. I didn't know uh, yeah, you had, that was much that. of that. So I was watching fullbacks that were in college. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't, you know, I, I knew obviously Walter Payton because I was from Detroit. He played against Detroit twice a year, being in Chicago. So I saw him, you know, I was a fan of his. Yeah. Um, Billy Sims was in Detroit and yeah. he was, you know, he was sensational as a as a running back. But outside of that, I didn't really watch a lot. So didn't get a chance to try to emulate, you know, those guys because I didn't think I was going to be this tailback. I was a fullback. You know, I got the ball maybe 10, 12 times a game if I was lucky. So I didn't think that my career would even be what it is. So yeah. I never really watched guys to run the football because I was more of a physical guy, pound and block and do all yeah. the, the dirty work. And, and so my career kind of made a change. And, you know, before it made the change, I was one of those guys, you know, down in the, uh, in the trenches. Yeah. So I asked Emmett what his favorite play to play running place. Like when he stood in the hub huddle and Troy Aikman called this play, he licked his chops. He told me it was the stretch play and then the cut, cut back off a stretch play. For you, I'm guessing it was something inside the tackles. Well, actually, for me, it was it was this play. That, it was called 38 Boss, and it was it was the back on the strong safety, meaning the fullback had the strong safety, and so it was this. It was a play that was supposed to get to the outside. In theory, in theory, it should go right outside the tight end and right inside 
of the strong safety. So the strong safety is going to come and feel the fullback's going to kick them out. Then I'm going to go inside and then work my way through the crease. And it was an amazing play because on that play, my center, Damani Dawson, would pull and get around, which was revolutionary. Yes. Um, that the center could hike and pull and be in front yeah. of the running back. And he was just that good. Yeah. Uh, a Hall of Fame player. Had him on the running. show. Had him on the show. He That's talks right. about him pulling. He actually talked yes. about, and you know how humble DeMonte yes, is. Yes. So he wouldn't really come out and say that he revolutionized it, but it oh. resonates that you're saying yes, it right. now. Absolutely gives it some street cred. That's so, right. He revolutionized thank you for, the position. Thank you for bringing and that up. Yeah. So that was the play, 38 Boss. When I heard it, I always knew. <laughs> that I had a couple options. I knew Damani was coming around the corner. I knew my, yeah. my fullback uh, was going to be kind of leading and kicking out. So I had a couple places where I can go, depending if the defense were trying to over pursue, they would sure. run to the spot where they think I was going to be turning up. But then sometimes yeah. I would turn up early. and t- So it was a great play for me. And I think, I mean, if I had to look at one play that I got, you know, majority of my yards on, that would be the one mm-hmm. play that um, if I didn't have that play, I probably would have not been in, and not been inducted in the Hall of Fame. That play was that significant for me in wow. my career. So this was this a play that, you know, it just sounds like a football play too. 38 balls, right? I mean, 38 it balls. just sounds it sounds like something that Bill Cowell would spit out on the sideline, right? <laughs> Am yeah. I right? You'd That's spray right. it at you, man, and you would go. So that was a Pittsburgh play, or was that a play that was that, around, that, was that a, you ran with the Rams? No, that was a Pittsburgh play. Now, the play that I ran with the Rams was the toss play, which we ran a toss play when the toss play was really going out of style because the hard part about a toss play was that your tight end yeah. had to be able to block a defensive end. Yeah. And most tight ends were more pass. They just weren't physical enough to block a defensive end. No. Well, we had a guy in, in L.A. who could block the end. Anybody. It didn't matter. He was that good. Who did we and have? And so was he, wasn't a, he wasn't a receiver as much as he was a blocker, a tight end. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you his name in a minute when it comes to me. But he could block the end, so we would always – we could pitch it. So we, yeah. we we ran a pitch, and it was downhill. It was just – it was a, a big play for us when I was with the Rams. Yeah. But when I got to Pittsburgh, we ran that – we ran it a little bit, but uh, obviously it wasn't the same kind of play yeah. that it was for us there. But the play that – was in Pittsburgh was the boss play oh, man. and that uh, that changed everything. I, I love it because I never knew that. And so now when I see you, uh, Jerome, and we see each other on several times, several occasions every year, it's going to go 38 boss to you and you're going to, 38 boss, and you're going to, baby. baby, you're going to smile, baby. You know, you're going to bring back and good then, memories. And then the latter part of my career, when Alifanica was blocking for me, we had a play and what we would do is this. It, and it was, it, we called it our bread and butter play. And so, and so the, the signal on the sideline was that oh, bread and butter. That's great. And, and that was, that was a, a counter. You know, we ran like, like a counter 34, counter 36. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, a, a pull, right, with the guard and tackle sometimes. And so that was another big play that we had success on a lot of my career. But 38 Boss was early. From the first day I got to Pittsburgh to the last day I was in Pittsburgh, that mm. was a play that we ran. So yeah. that was a, a special one. You were asked to become a fullback later on when uh, the Rams went to St. Louis, and you, they gave you basically an option, become a fullback, a new head coach. Let's mention that. Different philosophy, it happens. Right. Yep. And they, they gave you an option, become a fullback, or we can trade you. And you had a choice to go to either Houston or Pittsburgh. And you chose, and you know, looking back now, very wisely to go to Pittsburgh, although Eddie George ended up in Houston. So had you, you know, he wouldn't have gone to Houston had you gone there, obviously, but they did pick up a pretty good running back there. Um, why Pittsburgh over Houston? It just felt right. It fit you. Well, no, that, that was a pretty easy pick. One, it was a couple, couple reasons. One, the city of Pittsburgh loved big running backs. 
Yes. So if you look at the history of the running backs that they had there, there was a lot of big running backs that they that they lined. Yeah. Um, that was one. And the city revered its running backs probably more than they did their quarterbacks. So I was, you know, saying to myself, wow, this can be a great opportunity. But the biggest reason was they had just come off a Super Bowl loss. They had just lost to Dallas the year before I got there. So I'm saying to them, I'm thinking to myself, this is a championship caliber football team. Um, yeah. that I'm going to. I'm leaving a, a perennial losing team franchise yeah. yeah. that I'm going to a perennial winner, and they just lost in the Super Bowl, so they've got a championship talent all over the field. So yeah. now I'm saying to myself, this is the place that I want to go because I can add to that equation. And I was, I was uh, for the most part, correct. Uh, you had a great, you were comeback player of the year. The first year in Pittsburgh. Hello. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Uh, questions, anyone? <laughs> so, and, and you you land in a place where, you, as you just mentioned, great pedigree with running backs, Franco Harris and uh, Franco Harris. Rocky sticks, Blyer. Rocky yeah, Blyer, yeah, yeah, right. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Franco sticks out in my mind, obviously, because of one of the, you know, wildest plays in NFL history. So, uh how much are you in touch with Franco, with Rocky, some of these older guys? What have they meant to you? And was there a lot of pressure to continue that legacy when you came there because of the glory, that storied history of running backs in, in Pittsburgh? That was a certain that had to be a certain amount of uh, you know, heat to continue that legacy. Yeah, they, there is. I mean, when you go to Pittsburgh, the, the legacy is that they run the football, they've had great running backs throughout his career. And you're the next man up, and so yeah, yeah, there was there was pressure, but but it wasn't it wasn't a overly pronounced pressure in the sense that you know the the public didn't say, hey man, you got to get it done, you got to get it done. You knew what the standard was uh, going yeah. to Pittsburgh. The standard was the standard, and that's what it is. And so you understood it was about you know trying to win a championship every year, and so you had to raise your level to meet that team's level. And yeah. so for me, at, you know, coming in, I, you know, I wanted to win. I, I thought I knew what it took, but coming there, you learn more, you, you change your work, your habits and things that you're doing um, because it's a successful organization and they yeah. believe in doing it a certain way. So now you figure out how to, uh, to make it work. And, and that's what we did. And I got, you know, came there, figured out kind of what I needed to do to be successful and what I needed to do to really take take it up a notch. So the pressure was there, uh, but it was more pressure to win a championship than it was just to be the great running back. You know, it was like, hey, we've got a history of running the football. And those guys that, that you spoke, spoke of, Rocky and Franco, they were there. You know, I got a chance to know both of them, got mm -hmm. a chance to spend time with them. They became friends. And so that's just... I, Matter of fact, I, I talked to both of them not too not too long ago in, in the last couple of months, yeah. uh, uh, separate times. But, you know, st we still communicate. And so sure. it was that type of relationship there. So, you knew they were pulling for you. They wanted you to be successful. And and that's just kind of how it was in that Pittsburgh family, because yeah. once you play for the Steelers, you're part of the family. And so they made it feel like, you know, it was a family. How important was Bill Cowher to your success in Pittsburgh? And, and did he make you a better running back? Oh, absolutely. He, he was he, he was critical to my success because uh, a couple of things. One, he believed in running football. You know, he, yeah. he, he wasn't one of those coaches that wanted to air it out. Had he been that guy, then obviously I wouldn't have had the career that I had. So he was, first of all, a, a run first kind of football coach. He was also a player's coach. He was the kind of guy you want in the foxhole with you, uh, you know, when you, when you're going in, in the battle, you, you want him with you because he was just that kind of guy. And, and so energy, he was infectious. If I don't have coach Cower as a coach, I'm not the same, uh, running back because not only did he believe in me, even latter, the latter parts of my career, when a lot of people would have said, ah, you know what? we're we're done we're done with him 
Uh, let's get a younger version. You know, he said, no, nah, no, nah, he still got some tread left. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's bring him back for another one. You know, even when I wasn't the starter anymore, they still, instead of getting rid of me saying, you know what, he can be a problem because if he's not the starter, he can, he can create friction, right, in the locker room. Sure. And the, he understood what made me tick. And that I was a team guy and I was focused on winning the championship. And he wanted to utilize that as opposed to saying, no, nah, it's, it's time to get rid of this guy because we don't feel he's a he's a team kind of guy first. He understood who I was. He understood that I was a team player and um, decided to make, probably make the unpopular decision in terms of keeping me around when he probably didn't have to. That's powerful stuff right there, Bus. And uh you know, thank God for Myron Cope and <laughs> and and him. I know you've told the story a million times. Ah, boss. <laughs> ah, boss. Ah, boss. No, it's, it's a great nickname. And when I look at your career and the way you were able to exit, your a- exit strategy was impeccable. It was brilliant. It was well-timed. And most of us don't get the opportunity to say, hey, man, I'm going to go win a Super Bowl in my hometown <laughs> and I'm going to say sayonara and drop the mic. But you did, man. So tell me about that year, you know, Super Bowl 40, about the championship game when you made an impassioned speech in front of your teammates. Can you share that with our listeners, what that yeah, was? Well, and then what it felt like to be in Detroit world champion mm-hmm. in your hometown. So, so that season was, was very, it almost didn't happen actually. So the year before we had just lost in the AFC championship game. We lost to the Patriots at home in Pittsburgh. We lost that game on Sunday, Monday. I flew back to Atlanta on Tuesday. We had our, our daughter, me and my wife had my first child and Mm -hmm. she was, she came prematurely. And so she was, I think, 32 weeks. Uh, so she was very early. So she was in, in intensive care in the, in the NICU. And I was, you know, just, you know, ready to have retired. Let me, let me, let me go back. Before I left Pittsburgh, I, had, I gave a, a thank you speech to the team. I asked Coach Kyle, can I talk to him? We lost that game on Sunday. Monday, we came in as a team to meet. And Monday, I asked Coach, could I talk to I address the team? He didn't know what I was going to say. And I told them, basically, I was retiring. I thanked them for being great teammates. Uh, and Coach Cowher said, whoa, 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 whoa. After the meeting, said, hey, just take some time to think about it. Well, you know, the next day, my daughter's coming and everything's happening. So I am ready to retire. I know this is the next chapter of my life. And a couple of things happened that kind of changed everything. One, in the Super Bowl, Corey Dillon broke his broke a rib. I was the first alternate for the Pro Bowl that year, so they called me asked me to come to the, go to the Pro Bowl. And I told the guy, I said, you know what? No, I don't think I'm going to be going. I think I'm retired. I think that's it. I said, but let me talk to the boss, uh, me and my wife. I, I said, <laughs> so I talked to my wife, and she said, listen, if you really want to retire, this is probably a better way to leave the game. You don't want to leave with a loss to the Patriots. It's the last game that you ever play. And I said, you know what? You're right. Yeah. So I said, you know what? I'll go to the Pro Bowl. But that year, the Steelers were 15 and one. So we had like eight guys in the Pro Bowl. So now we had eight guys in the Pro Bowl. But that was one of the last years that the team that lost the AFC Championship, the coaches, would coach in the Pro Bowl. So now you have the entire coaching staff. You have eight players. Those eight players brought another two or three guys each. So you had about 25 or 30 players. You had the owners. You had everybody. So the Steelers did a Steeler Luau in Hawaii for the Pro Bowl. So I decided to go. My wife says, hey, you know, this is the right thing for you to do, right? I decided to go. And there was two guys that actually talked me um, into coming back. They said, hey, it's going to be a shame the Super Bowl is in Detroit next year, your hometown, and you're not going to be there. And I was like, what? I didn't realize the Super Bowl was going to be in Detroit the next year because as football players, we don't think about the next year and where the Super Bowl no. is. We, we no. were one year at a time, right? So when they said, man, it's going to be a shame, we're going to go, we're going to go, 
win the Super Bowl in your hometown and you're not going to be there. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm getting on that, that bus. Made, <laughs> that, I was like, oh, man, I got it. So that's one of the big, big thoughts in my head to, to come back for one more year. I knew we were a good team. We were 15 and one. And I said, man, I got to, I might have to give it another shot. Talked it over with my wife, decided to come back for one more year, come back and the season not going as well as we thought it was going to go. And all of a sudden we got four games to go and we're going to, you know, if we lose one game, we don't even go to the playoffs, but we win all those games. We get in the playoffs as we're going, we, we play in the um, AFC championship game out in Denver, Colorado. We win that football game. All of a sudden now, you know, we're going to the Super Bowl, right? And it's in Detroit. And it was such a magical moment. Obviously, you know, you dream of going to the Super Bowl, but you never dream about it going to your hometown. No. Um, and, I, and so it just became, it took on so much more uh, because yeah. the requests and, oh, yeah. and, and the cameras and everything. Oh, yeah. um, but, but it was great because this was the moment that I had always dreamed of. I always wanted to be a part of winning a championship. And so we, we get in the game, get to the game day. And, and obviously the week before was, was like, you just want to get to the game. Yes. Uh, and so we get to the game and it's all the pageantry and, and, and all this going on and, and you're kind of in it. But as soon as the kickoff happened, it's like you kind of, you go from an outwardly focused to zero and right in, bang, game time. So now we, you know, getting in the game, getting in those opportunities. And and late in the game when, you know, the game was pretty much in hand and you, yep. re you realize that you're going to be a champion. I think that's when, that's when the goose, the goosebumps kind of, kind of hit you. And you're like, wow, this, this is actually going to happen for me. And because for me, it had been third, 12 years, you know, prior that, I had always, you know, been a bridesmaid, never the bride, never won, never won, uh, never won it in college, came close in college, uh, yeah. you know, lost in the playoffs in high school, never got there. And here we are with a chance now to win it. And, and the game is over and they give you the trophy. And, yeah. you know, I, you always see people hugging it and kissing it. And it, it, it's finally in your hands, right? And so it was that magical moment for me. But it was it was even more special because my mom and dad were in the stadium and they had an incredible note with my mom and dad was they never missed a game. I played in the NFL for 13 years. Wow. They went to every single football game. Wow. So for them, it was just as much of a, a special moment as to me, because sure. they went they were, went through the journey every game, every yeah. year. And so. For them to be there to celebrate it with me, it was just the most incredible moment that yeah. um, I ever had. And, I, and I, that's what I cherish the most, being able to win a championship in my hometown with my parents yeah. watching. Yeah. And, and it was just you magic. You couldn't ride it any better. You, Confetti you is raining you down couldn't. on you. You're hoisting the Lombardi in front of your family in the town where you were born and grew up. And it, it, it just dropped the mic. You dropped the mic and you yeah. said, hey, listen, now is the time to retire, right? That's you knew it. right then that the perfect storm had absolutely come. And uh, yeah, and it, it, it became a beautiful exit. Yep. And man, then you get to Canton, Ohio, and the bus stops there forever <laughs> as a pro Ever. football Hall of Famer. Loved your acceptance speech, uh, bus. I thought it was great. You had so many uh, fans there, Pittsburgh fans and Detroit fans, you know, just Yes. Bus fans, Jerome fans. I was there. I was in the audience uh, saying, man, one day, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe I'll be up there. Sure enough, two years it, later. It, it happened, baby. Oh, it my happened. goodness. So great. So great. So it's just been a, a fantastic journey for you. I'm not going to. I just want to get your thoughts on, on, on present day Steelers. OK, so I just got a few questions for you on, on that. Steelers drafted a running back in the first round this year. Uh, Najee Harris from Alabama. And a lot of hype, a lot of hype for this kid heading into the season. And we all, we know about hype. Some of it is unfounded. Some of it is, you know, conjecture, whatever. Your, your take on, on Najee Harris, does he go over or under 1,000 yards this year? I think he goes over 1,000 yards. I think if, if the Steelers want to be the team that they can be, 
Yeah, uh, I think they need him to, to be a thousand yard rusher. So okay. I'm saying I'm saying over. And the Steelers came out of the gate hot last season. They won their 11 straight games to start the season, and then they kind of fizzled out and eventually lost to the Browns, of course, mm-hmm. in, the, in the postseason. Do you have the Steelers going over or under nine wins this this season? Over nine wins, for sure. I, I think they're going to still be a, a championship caliber team. Derrick Henry, hell of a running back, power running back in today's game. Rushed for 2,000 yards last season. He looked, I mean, sometimes, Buzz, he looked unstoppable. He really did. He did. Do, do you see Amazing. him going over or under? I'm going to pick this number here, 1,525 yards this season. History says usually after a big year like that, sometimes injury can, the injury bug comes in. Um, so I'm going to say under 15, under 1525. Okay. Who do you think wins the AFC and the NFC this year? That's a good question there. Um, this is just fun. I mean, it, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure out, I, you know what I, I'm the more and more I look at it. I like the Rams. I think the Rams have a great chance. So I'm picking my two old teams. I'm going to Rams and the Steelers. Oh, I like. I'm going to end with a little name game with you, if you're if you're okay with that, Buzz. Sure. Sure. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a name, and you can say one word, a sentence, whatever comes to mind. Uh, Bill Cower. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Roethlisberger. My man. Heinz he Ward. saved me. He saved Go me ahead. in that playoff game. My man. How do he save you in the playoff game? Uh, we, we were playing Indianapolis Colts, and uh, I fumbled in that game at the end of the game. Yeah, I remember And that. the guy picks up the ball, the cornerback, and he's running for a touchdown, and it's only him and Ben. I remember. And ben is weaving and weaving in some yes. kind of way. Yes. He finds a way to tackle this guy. If he doesn't tackle him, we lose. We don't go to the Super Bowl. Oh, I remember it's, that. It's a bad thing. So Ben is always my guy. I love that. Heinz Ward. The smile. What you call him? The smile. He's always smiling. Well, just like you, man. He must be brothers. <laughs> Alan Fanica. Oh, red. He had red hair, so we call it red. Okay. Isaac Bruce. Stud. Isaac yeah. was a stud. Rocket Ismail. Fast. Yes. <laughs> oh, he was I, fast. Bruce Arians. BA. Great coach. Finally recognized for it. Yeah. Cordell Stewart. Slash. Why you call him Slash? That was his nickname? It, his nickname was Slash because he could do it all. He could he could okay. throw it, he could catch it, he could run it. He was he huh. was just uh, he was he was today's quarterback, you know, 20 years ago. That's that's huh. unfortunately the problem. That's interesting. Yep, yep. Uh Mike Rabel. Mike Rabel. Uh student becoming the master. He was a mm. great student of the game and now uh, and a student of, of great coaches. And now he's becoming a great coach. I like that. I like that a lot, boss. You got some great introspection, brother. I see. I knew you were going to be a great guest. Let's face it. <laughs> I was just, you know, I learned so much from you over the years, how to handle yourself, how to handle your brand. I made mistakes, but you know what? You're always there with good wisdom. I appreciate that. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, Troy Polamalu. Troy. Oh. Uh, he, he had all that hair and he would, and, and, and he, because he was, we sat next to each other in the locker room. He was the nicest guy in the world. But as soon as he got on the field and he let his hair down, he became like the Tasmanian devil. He became a toy. <laughs> A wild man. Yeah, a, a wild different man. Game. And he would throw himself all over the field. He was he was special. Rod Woodson. Uh, Rod Woodson, the the elder statesman. Rod, when I got to Pittsburgh, he was the he was the elder statesman. But you know, he was the the guy who had done it all, seen it all. Yeah. And uh, he was T 
teaching all the young guys what what to and what not to do. Damani Dawson. Double D, uh, the best. Yeah. The best center that ever played the game. Wow, that's big words from a pretty good running back. Plaxico Burris. Plax. Uh, the word that comes is wish. I wish he could have got reached his full potential in Pittsburgh. I uh-huh. think ultimately he did, but it didn't happen in Pittsburgh because he was really special uh-huh. uh, as a football player. Yeah. And he, he proved to be with helping the Giants win the championship. Yeah. But um, I wish, I just wish he would have been able to reach it in, in, in Pittsburgh. He would have been fun to watch. Yeah, that's good. That's wise words on that. Uh, Joey Porter. Just laugh. Whenever I think of Joey, I laugh. <laughs> Joey was so crazy. I mean, is crazy. He's the craziest guy in the world. But um, he always did something to make make me laugh. And, and he was just <laughs> his special guy. But he got on the field. He was nuts. You got to have those guys, man. You got to have those guys. You got to have the fill in the blanks. Guys. That's right. And, and those defensive guys are always the nuttiest ones, right? And he was oh. he was especially nutty. <laughs> Casey Hampton. Uh, Big Snack. That was his nickname. <laughs> That's snack. a great nickname. Big Snack? Big Snack. Um, oh, uh, that is awesome. Hamp, Hamp was amazing. At his size, to, to beat as fast as he was, I mean, yeah. he was – and he's un, un, underappreciated because people don't know how great a player he was. He never got any of the credit because he, he, he did a lot of the dirty work. But, I mean, he was one of the best defense nose guards that Pittsburgh had ever seen. I mean, he yeah. was that good. Well, I got to end with, with the head coach, Lou Holtz. Wow. Um, mentor. I would, I would mentor because – Coach Holtz was a mentor, you know, obviously as an 18 year old kid getting on campus, I was, you know, very, very receptive to the coaching, yeah. uh, to his philosophies. Yeah. But, but also when I left, I, I would come back and, and get his opinion on things that were going on. He coached Bill Cowher in college at North Carolina state. So when I went back to school, he told me to, Hey, Pittsburgh is a you know great place. Coach Cowher is a great coach. You know, yeah. so you know he's been a mentor along the, when I when I was ready to retire. You know, we talked about public speaking and and yes. he helped me there. So he's been a mentor every step of the way. Yeah, I agree with you. Lou Lou Holtz never missed an opportunity in life to teach. He grabbed every every moment that he could on that, and and still yeah. does, you know, and 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 teaches. That's right. Yeah, yeah, but very good, boss. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, man. No problem, man. I, I pre- I, yeah, I just appreciate the way you are, you know, and the way you are with people. You're just a likable guy, and you're kind. <laughs> I think that's I the biggest compliment that, I can give you. You're a, you're a kind gentleman who always uh, is just a delight to be around. And I, I love you very much. And I can't wait to see you next, soon. All right, Morton. I can't wait to see you soon, man. Hey, All thanks right, for having me on the show. See you, buddy. Take care.